It's been another eventful week in the banking industry. At Barclays, there's been a management revamp. At RBS, another bonus row. And at Bank of America, they've exposed an embarrassing accounting glitch. To discuss these and other issues in the banking industry, I'm joined by Lionel Barber, the FT's editor. Lionel, it's very timely that you should be giving your city lecture at Hughes Hall, Cambridge University. Um, you ask a pretty provocative question with the title of the lecture, which I've got here, Can Banking Clean Up Its Act? What do you think? Well, you need a provocative uh, question to get the audience, and I think the answer is yes, they have cleaned up their act to a large degree, largely because of the uh, incredible amount of new regulations and laws, the higher capital ratios, uh, and you know, curbs on risk ta taking, trading, etc. But the longer term question is can they really clean their act? And that goes to the structure of these banks and this combination of trading and commercial banking. Well, that's particularly uh, uh, relevant in the UK where, where we've got the Vickers rules coming in, which are going to force banks to ring fence their retail banking operations from their investment banking operations. Similar rules probable in Europe, uh, and the US has gone a slightly different route, but we're going to see more tightly controlled operations everywhere. Do you think that that leads to um, more pressure to actually break up the banks altogether, to go further than the rules demand? I think you're actually seeing this, um, notably at Barclays, where Anthony Jenkins, the new chief executive, is struggling manfully to try and accommodate these two, I think, actually conflicting cultures, the trading culture and the normal commercial banking culture. Um, you're going to see a shrunken investment bank at Barclays. Uh, and elsewhere, as I say, this is happening almost without a full, what we known as the Glass-Steagall, after the act in the 1930s in America, splitting. But ring fencing is a long way along that route, and it's almost likely to be a byproduct. We may not see it today, but tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. We've already, already seen initiatives in that regard from HSBC sounding out investors about potential flotation of their UK business, for example. It's the end of what we know as the universal bank, the all-singing, all-dancing bank. Now that's particularly relevant in the, in the UK and Europe. As I say, the, there are initiatives in the US as well to, to go down a vaguely similar route, but it's far less onerous, the kind of structural constraints that are being put on there, despite all the, uh, the Dodd-Frank uh, shenanigans that is, is being implemented over, will take years to implement all of those rules. Many people think that the US banks are ultimately going to come out of this whole rejig in a far more uh, stronger position than their European rivals, and they will dominate the world potentially with universal banks going forward. And wouldn't that be an ironic uh, matter, given that the uh, uh, problem and the meltdown originated in the United States in 2008 with Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns going down? And remember, ironically, huge consolidation. We've got actually now, as a result of the crash, and this is what I say in the lecture, f fewer systemically but systemically important banks. Yeah, uh, the they're only much more systemically important now than they ever were. Indeed. Yeah. The question I would ask is, after the crash now, uh, and given the, the weight of legislation, and it's huge, I mean, the rulemaking of Dodd-Frank, I mean, it goes into thousands of pages, is are these banks actually going to reduce their global footprints? They become more domestic players. Well, we've, st we've started to see that, particularly among some of the European banks, haven't we? We've seen HSBC, but also Citigroup, to an extent, retrenching. The ones that got into the most trouble, I suppose, in the crisis have retrenched. Um, there will be space, no doubt, created from this clampdown on banks in the broader financial space. There will be room for non-banks to thrive. And we've already seen uh, a lot of talk among regulators about the risks that may be building, building up in this so-called shadow banking uh, arena. Do you, do you think that's the biggest danger the world faces going forward in terms of financial risk? We should emphasize that we can't dispense with risk. We shouldn't attempt to do so. We shouldn't, by the way, attempt to turn bankers into saints. Risk does not disappear. So the question is, where is it going? Certainly, we want to look at this so-called shadow banking sector, the hedge funds, some of these very I mean, highly respected, big, powerful financial players like Blackstone, BlackRock. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them at all. It's just they are getting into different areas, huge areas of property, real estate investment. And then, of course, you've got to look at the insurance sector, the life assurance sector. 
Yet so another challenge for regulators, basically. That, that's the next chapter, I think, or the next lecture. <laughs> Lionel, thank you very much.